Hello, and welcome to another episode of 20 Minute Playbook, where each week we sit down with an elite performer from iconic founders to world-renowned investors and best-selling authors to dive into the ideas, frameworks, and strategies that got them to the top of their field, all in less than 20 minutes. I'm Daniel Scrivener, and on the show today, I'm joined by Ben Blumenrose. Ben is the co-founder, co-director, and managing partner of Designer Fund, which is an early-stage venture capital firm that backs founders who both recognize the power of design and are committed to getting design right in their company from day one. Designer Fund was founded in 2012, when there were a few other companies in Silicon Valley outside of Apple that even understood the power of design to build incredible products, create a category-defining brand, and ultimately forge an enduring company. At the time, there were also no other venture capitalists with the design background. And yet, over the last decade, Designer Fund has built an exceptional venture firm. They produced top quartile returns, rewarding their investors and beating out most of their peers, and were early investors in a wave of design-centric companies that have defined the last decade, including Stripe and Gusto. Before co-founding Designer Fund with Enrique Allen in 2012, Ben was a design lead at Facebook for nearly six years, after joining when the team was just around 100 people in size. In this episode, you'll learn why Ben is fascinated with AI like Dolly 2 that can create original artwork and what that might mean for intellectual property rights and monetization for artists of all shapes and sizes. Why design is utility-centric where art is simply about expression and Ben's thoughts on why design matters. What Ben has learned from studying natural ecosystems and why they make it clear that our growth at all costs mentality is flawed. Ben shares his favorite books, including the murder by diary series by Martha Wells about a violent, self-hacking cyborg that's searching for the meaning of life. He shares his superpowers, including being able to tell when a product is incredibly well designed, as well as why the gap between great and extraordinary is much bigger than most of us think it is. And he shares the biggest lessons he's learned building Designer Fund over the last decade, as well as the advice he'd give himself if he could go back to the start of his career. You can find the show notes and text transcript for this episode at outlieracademy.com slash 132. That's outlieracademy.com slash 132. And you can follow Ben on Twitter at Ben Blumenrose and learn more about Designer Fund at designerfund.com. With that, let's dive into Ben Blumenrose's playbook. Ben Blumenrose, I'm thrilled to have you on 20 Minute Playbook. Thank you so much for joining me today. Yeah, thanks for having me. So let's jump right in. I'd love to start with a recent fascination. What are you fascinated or obsessed by at the moment? What can't you stop thinking about? Uh, right now, AI and design tools, processes, all that stuff. I think the Dolly, the whole like rise of Dolly, um, all of a sudden brought with it this other, um, this other swell of creative tooling that was using AI. And I don't know if you saw this, but like, you know, for four or five years, we've been seeing AI and ML as buzz buzzwords mm -hmm. uh, in fundraising decks where you're like, ah, it's like, you know, they're just trying to throw a bunch of fun, you know, words that they think investors will, will gravitate towards. But man, in creative tools, all of a sudden, the way AI and ML is getting used in design and writing, you know, to augment writing, to augment uh that speed up design processes is just crazy. And I just think like, it's really having a moment and it's happening way faster than I thought it would. And so I think for designers are really, it's like, what do we do in a world where anyone can just speak an image to existence? What does that mean for photographers and illustrators, right? And then guess what product designers, it's coming for you too, right? Like when someone just says, I need an app that has a feed with, you know, it's like, right? Like that's coming. So it's going to be Dolly design? 3. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not that far away. So what is our role in that world? And I think it's going to be interesting. So I am, I'm, I'm pretty fascinated by it right now. Yeah, I'd love to get your thoughts, you know, maybe just to double click on that on a little bit, because I guess in my mind, I think people are, I don't know, I've seen a lot of people have a reaction to Dolly 2 basically saying, Oh, my gosh, it's coming after designers. And in my mind, you hit the nail on the head. It's not coming after designers yet. It's coming after artists. It's coming after photographers and illustrators. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and then secondarily, you know, there's also a lot of AI tools now that are doing copywriting for you. Um, so it's either taking your bad copy and turning it into okay copy, or it's trying to kind of create copy from scratch. W what are your thoughts on both of those? So far, it just seems like supporting tool sets. Yeah, I mean, I think it is to an extent. Um, I, de I definitely think for a lot of things, 
it's one of the, you know, let's say I'm an illustrator, right? And someone comes to me and they say, okay, here's, I, I want an illustration that does X, Y, Z. Um, well, then you as an illustrator are going to spend hours and hours sketching a bunch of ideas. And then you're going to go to the client and be like, okay, any of these? And like, no, 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 it's more like the trees need to be bigger and this needs to be more green. And so there's hours and hours of time spent just communicating, right? Because you have a, someone who has a vision for what the thing should be trying to communicate to the, to the artist. And I think one of the, to me, one of the really cool use cases for something like Dolly is to, to give that superpower to the person who's trying to communicate to the visual artist, like, hey, this is what I mean. Like, here's a, here's a visual representation that's pretty close or captures some of the essence or the tone. Um, and then go off that. And now we're starting way further than we would have started um, before. But, but it does like, you know, at a certain point. So for example, you know, we're investors in a company called Framer, right? And so Framer was this prototyping tool. And at first it was never intended to create the final output. But slowly over time, it's like as the prototyping tool, well, guess what? Like the prototypes, what are they using to build the prototype? You know, it's HTML and CSS. Like, well, that's that's a website, right? And then so Framer all of a sudden gets, gets they realize like, wait a second, like this tool set that we built, we can call it whatever we, we want to call it. But at the end of the day, it's actually building a final deliverable that people work really hard to, to build. And we've created a much easier way to do that. And so... That's where the tension is for me, where it's like, yeah, for a lot of the workflows, it's going to get you 80 or 90% of the way there, 60, whatever, and you're going to need the artists um, to, to, to then take it to, to the final stage. But like, there will be things where it'll be good enough, right? If, I, if I'm doing a blog post and I can't afford an artist for $1,000 or $2,000, like, it's probably good enough, right? Um, so to me, I think like, it's interesting. And then also, hey, guess what, artists, like these tools need your work to build the data models, right? But these artists, they're not being compensated in any way, you know, for their for their intellectual property. And it is it is like their work, right? So I think that's also interesting. Like, if you want to do, obviously, this is not possible, but like they let you do uh, things in the style of Van Gogh, you know, uh, illustrations in the style of Van Gogh. Um, well, let's say there was Daniel Scrivener had a unique illustration style and there's plenty of illustrators that have that. And I want to mm -hmm. do an illustration in the style of Daniel Scrivener. To me, it makes sense that Dolly would say, okay, we'll check this out. Like, we'll let you do an illustration in the style of Daniel Scrivener, not the real thing. It's like the equivalent of, you don't get the original painting, you get the, the printout. <laughs> and guess what? Daniel Scrivener gets uh, five bucks for that, you know, not a thousand. But you, you literally did not, you, you, Daniel, didn't need to do anything. Right. All you needed to do was create a body of work that this AI system can build a, a virtual you, right? That's good enough for 90% of the use case. And all of a sudden it, it multiplied your impact by, you know, a hundred X, a thousand X. So that stuff is, man, that stuff is crazy. It's fascinating. And yeah, I'm, I'm kind of, I think like the designers need to lean into it and understand where the edges are for us as opposed to, I think it's very easy to just be like, this is terrible, like machine sticking over, let's, let's, uh, let's fight this tooth and nail. Well, it's it's kind of happening and, and we need to embrace it and kind of think about how we, how we use it to our advantage uh, in the creative process and, 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 and go from there. It's fascinating. I, I love the way you articulated that. You know, the two things that stood out to me is, I think your note uh, is really important around how compensation will work and how intellectual property rights will change or need to be able to change or at least need to need to take into account that yes, you didn't, you know, you Daniel Scrivener didn't have to do the work to generate this this AI generated artwork, but it's using your intellectual property, and so you'd imagine that 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 should kind of build on something. And it also makes me think of you know, I don't know, sometimes it's helpful to to jump to a different industry, because it, you might look at things a little bit differently. But I would say, uh, you know, I, I don't think any illustrator would disagree that they should get compensated if they do some piece of artwork in that style. Um, if you were to go and do this in music, and you said, give me a, a beat like Timbaland, I mm. bet Timbaland would want to be compensated <laughs> for yeah. having that style, um, because it's iconic, his name's on it, his tag's on it. Um, it's really interesting. I, I, I want to ask a question around how you think about design and, and what design means to you. And to kind of tee it up, you know, um, you've spent your entire career focused on design. You, from your design work as a design lead at Facebook in its early years, um, to your role as co-director and managing partner at Designer Fund, how do you think about design and what does design mean to you? And it's a very wide open question, so feel free to take that from any level, from any angle. 
maybe the way I will answer that is just like, why, why have I, like, why is design important to you? Is that maybe mm-hmm. kind of, or like, why, why that's even great. care? Is that kind of Yeah, what you're I think at? I think for a lot of people listening, that's probably the question they would ask. Why is you care? <laughs> yeah. So here's the thing, I think, and, and I obviously I've spent decades thinking, thinking about this. Um, at, at, when design is inherent in design, when done well, is this idea of creating something for a person to use. The act of deliberate creation uh, for a specific use case, right? It's not art, right? There We have art. Design is really, it's meant to be, there's a utility there, right? So inherent in design is the idea that something should be useful. Um, and hopefully, I, I, I hope for most designers, it's useful for good, right? So let's, when you think about like the building blocks of a, of a tech company, Okay, you have designers, then you have engineers. What what's at the the core of engineering is uh, it's it's like the motivation is is solving complex problems, and there may be a use user at the end of that, or may not be right. So inherent in good engineering is not necessarily something that's more useful for a person, right? Uh, mm-hmm. It could be, and it often is, but it but it doesn't have to be. It's not inherent in in the work. Uh, and then you have, you know, you go to business school. Okay, well, what do we, what, what gets business, you know, people go to business school excited. Well, for them, it's uh, building a massive business, right? So like getting people to buy stuff uh, or building something of value. So again, users could, you know, people could be at the end of that in some way, but they don't have to be, right? Um, and often what I found is there's like a tension there between domain experts, designers, engineers, and, you know, your MBA folks. And it just so happens that designers and maybe you, you know, customer support people kind of play this role too. They're kind of the, u- the the end user advocates often, right? And so they're the ones who are saying, well, wait a second, like who's going to use this? Why are they going to use this this way? Why is this good for them to use? And so when you when you take that out of, of a company, all of a sudden, like the balance is off, right? If you have like engineers solving really tough, difficult engineering problems and business folks trying to build a big business, well... There's all sorts of ways to like man- manipulate and and have that grow in a way that actually isn't serving humanity well. And it's again, it's not to say like to get up here and be like, oh yeah, design's the end, I'll be all, and we always do it right. We don't always do it right, but there's something inherent in in design done well that is that it, you know when you break it down to just its core essence, it, it's trying to help people do things well. And so for me, that's why it's really important because when you take that away, and that and that's honestly like why we started Designer Fund. It wasn't like I, I had a ambition to be an investor by any means, but it's just that people were asking me for help on design so much uh, on things like education and healthcare. Um, and you start thinking, well, wait a second, if design is absent from these, mm-hmm. from the from the from the building of these products and services, then who who's here to make sure that you know in hospitals that patients are being cared for the right way? Who's who's here to make sure that students are being cared for the right way versus just like building something that's good for the school system or good for the hospital, right? So that's the thing that I think for me is um, is the importance of why, why I'm so like into getting getting design at, at the ground floor of every like great company that, that is getting started today. Because if not, we're just gonna get th- those those products and services and we've all experienced it, right? Like if you've gone to a doctor recently, and you've watched the doctor look at the screen half of the time or more versus look at you, the patient, uh, you've kind of felt what happens when design is absent from these things. That's kind of the thing we're trying to fight against. Uh, so yeah, that's that's kind of like why for me design is so important and, and why I, I fight for it and advocate for it and try to like uh, advocate for it in the, in the VC ecosystem. Yeah. I love that perspective. I mean, it almost sounds like a way to think about design in your mind is as guardrails. You know, it's like you can channel the resources, meaning your engineers and the money that you've raised in business and all these ideas and feedback you've gotten from customers in a lot of different directions. And maybe design adds a little bit more intentionality and tries to just make sure that that's all pointed and harnessed in the right direction. Yeah. And and I would say, you know, one of the things that I'm trying to also champion, there's this idea of like human-centered design. You've probably heard of this, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and that sounds great. So that's what's human. It's like it's basically designing for the per, for an individual. Um, but I think one of the things that's lacking in human centered design is like humanity centered design, right? Because when you're optimizing for the individuals, 
well, then what happens to the ecosystem at large? And I think, you know, frankly, this is this is basically um, what happened at Facebook as we were, we were trying to create this thing that every individual got a lot of utility out, out of, assuming that if people loved it for themselves, that that would somehow create um, value or like move humanity in the right direction. And my personal opinion is, is that it's not enough to just say, oh, I'm going to give you, you yourself, you the person, something that works for you without taking into account, well, how does that work for you and your community? How does that work for you and your country? How does that work for you and the world? And so that's that's a, another piece that I'm hoping like more formal design education starts to take into account is kind of like the humanity centered approach to design and have that be baked into to the work that we do. Yeah. I'd love to ask a question kind of, you know, super Ben focused, uh, which is, you know, as a designer by background, who and what inspires you? And, you know, I guess, you know, things that come to mind are, are there any uh, designers, uh, illustrators, artists, either historical or, uh, you know, that are active now that inspire you? Or are there any products or companies that you just think the world of? Yeah, you know, I, I think that because I come from like, I mean, I come from the fine art world, right? Or not, not right. Like I, I, my background background is fine art. Like that's, that's, that was, as a kid, I always draw, you know, drew, painted. Uh, and then when computers were invented, I just thought, oh, computer art, I can make money off that. Like that's a thing. Someone will pay me a ton of money to do. Like I definitely <laughs> want to do that. So I think I gravitate towards people who are uh, and designers that are, you know, they're almost like artists. And, um, I love this with people and I love this with companies too. And it's basically this, it's like, take like a task, you know, like uh, designing a poster, or designing a website or designing a product. And certain people will be like, okay, what's a reasonable amount of time to, to do that? You know, so it's like a website, you know, what's a, what's a reasonable amount of time to spend on the normal marketing site? Well, it's, I don't know, 30 hours. I don't know, what would you say is like a good, good, good amount of time? It's much higher than that, but I'll, oh. I'll stay out of this one. <laughs> no, just, to, just the visual design, the visual design of a basic marketing site. Oh, yeah, site. Take, take 30, 30, 30 hours, 40, 40 hours. hours. Yeah. Okay. Um, to me, it's like, who, who, who spends 300 hours to do that, right? And, and that's like, you know, when you look at like, okay, let's take Stripe, for example, on their marketing sites and the, the level of detail. And it, it's just so ungodly over the top. And you just say like, why? Well, you know, why did you go that far? And, and you realize that because it attracts other people who go that far, right? Um, and so I've always, for me, I've always gravitated towards the people who go, so much further than everyone not like 10 percent more but like way way more so like there's a designer that uh, used to work with me on my team his name's ben barry you can look up his his work online and ben was always like you know i'd always uh, i managed him for a little while and he, he would say things like, I'd be like okay how, how long would this take you know and he's like oh i need i need six weeks for that i'm like six weeks like <laughs> i have six weeks <laughs> you know we have a week I, you, I, I was hoping it'd be like a week or a week and a half and he's like no i need six and i'll spend 10 hours a day on it and it'll be extraordinary and extraordinary and the difference between extraordinary and very good is actually quite huge because extraordinary is the thing that everyone talks about and very good is just like oh okay that's there's a lot of very good things and there are a few things that just are extraordinary. And they, they're, those are the things that get talked about. So you need to find the right time to do that. So Ben Berry does that. Um, uh, Jessica Hish, who you may maybe know, she's a letterer. Um, and that's, you know, it's just like people who have this like level of craft and they just go so, they're, they're, they just go so much further than everyone else. They just take that time and that energy. Uh, so those are the things that always inspire me. It's like, what is what is in you that lets you go to version 45, version 70, version 85, right? When you see that file list, you know, it's like website V114. And you're like, what? Oh my goodness, man. How long? Wow. Yeah. So that's the stuff I think I, I, I really um, um, am inspired by. Yeah. I love that answer because it speaks, you know, my language. I identify with that so much. And, you know, the the I think a word that I think is synonymous with design in many ways is craftsmanship. And craftsmanship, really, when you ask what is it, it is literally the act of going much further than most people would expect you to go. You know, it makes me think of the Steve Jobs or, or Johnny Ives quote of, you know, painting the back of the dresser drawer, 
no one's going to see it. But if it comes yeah. out, you know, I think that level makes sense. And, you know, just and then maybe one random story that I'll throw in. This is one of the reasons that, um, you know, I've been fortunate enough to be on a bunch of amazing design teams, but I still think one of my favorite experiences um, was working at Apple. And when I was there at the time, this is quite a few years ago, back when we were working on uh, one of the many projects that was happening in the building was uh, the new design for the iTunes icon. Uh, and this then became somewhat generic in, in what was selected, which is a little bit of a bummer. Uh, it was just like a CD with music notes, you know, that's a slightly different color. But if you but what nobody saw that I got to see was the behind the scenes process behind that. And it literally, to your point, there was one full time person who literally all he did was do explorations on the iTunes icon. I think he did that project for literally six months. And the concepts that he came up with were just amazing. It was everything from like a circus tent that sold tickets to the front of a movie theater <laughs> to a guitar to simulations of what music might look like. Yeah. Um, and to your point, I, you know, I, I think that's how you arrive at something really incredible. But then you, and then it lands on music, music notes, right? Yes. And then and it's, like, you know, oh. bum, bum, bum. It's a little bit of a disappointment <laughs> to the journey. But, <laughs> but that's, you know, a, that's a, a separate thing. It's but separate. here's what's fun. So like at Facebook early days, like we used to have these icons that were not, they were like way more pixelated. That we, we almost had like a pixelated style early on, but we were super into the stuff that Apple was doing and really inspired by the level of craft there. And so like, even within the, the, the constraints of these like tiny pixelated icons, we still had our designers who would just sit there and be like, okay, like, because this is going to be seen by so many people, like, how does it communicate the right concept? And and it seems when you looked at them, you're like, someone must have spent 20 minutes on this. I remember when yeah. we were even hiring designers, people were like, there are designers at Facebook? Like, it doesn't even look like it's designed because it almost <laughs> looked like a wireframe. Well, early on, that's what it looked like. You know, the site looked yeah. like very wireframing. They thought it was just Mark, you know, they used to say Mark Zuckerberg, Mark Zuckerberg production. And so... But we were inspired, like we would look at Apple and we'd say, look how far they've gone. Let's do that too. Let's, let's go that far. And so I think that's the thing. It's like, you know, and by the way, this is totally antithetical to the whole like startup, move fast, break things and, you know, do the MVP, all that stuff. And so I'm not saying like, and this is exactly why, why people get frustrated with designers because you say, hey, I just need a quick site. And they're like, give me eight weeks, right? Uh, so you need to know like when to pick and choose your, your times and your moments to sweat those details. And then you you also need to know when's the time to just like do a site in a day because it just needs to be done and we need to like go, 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 right? So I'm yeah. not, yeah, I, I need to make sure that you, there's the yin and yang to all these things. Well, and that balance is really, is really, really, really hard to achieve. Yeah. Um, I, I want to talk for a second, you know, you gave, I think, a you know great overview of how to think about design uh, philosophically and uh, what it's doing for people and how it's kind of making sure to de to deliver something of value that improves the world for the for the kind of end human or in, in customer. Um, yeah, I want to switch and, and talk a little bit about the business value of design. And I guess the question I would ask there is, you know, when you are talking, let's say, with the CEO and having that conversation, uh, does it really make sense to spend another month on this or another two months on this? How do you think about the business value of design and how it actually contributes value to a company and helps grow its value and grow its reach over time? Yeah. So here, here's the thing. Okay. So I, lo I love this question because um, to me, design is, it's this layer it's a horizontal layer you can literally apply that layer to anything okay and i'll give you an example like when i joined facebook i joined as a product designer in the we were in the engineering org so like for me to stay in my lane would have meant hey ben just build facebook.com products do nothing else and by the way there was plenty of stuff to do there right so it's like why would you even like don't even you don't, you don't need to go to talk to hr or legal or but I was, you know, I was curious. I had joined the company was about, I don't know, 150, 200 people. And to me, it was like, where else can design have value in this company? So one of the things I did when I first joined Facebook, I found every head of X, right? Head of marketing, head of legal, head of HR, um, head of customer support. And I just said, look, I'm a designer here. What would you do with design? What would you do with design resources? Because I was a big believer that design, you know, and maybe like I drank my own, own Kool-Aid too much, but I was a big believer that we could change any, we could supercharge anything, we could improve anything, right? Because design is, you just apply it and bam, right? And so I would say more than half of them were just like, I never even thought about that. That never even crossed my mind that, you know, <laughs> um, recruiting, 
design and recruiting is why that's not even a thing. Why is that even a thing? It's like, well, where are people finding out about Facebook? What kind of experience are they having when they come to, to interview? What are they, the, what, what's the experience after? Um, and even just this idea of an experience that you're having, it's like, what is, what do you mean by that? What, why is that? What they come to interview? That's, that's a thing that's designed that it's like, yes, it's designed or not. Right. But it's still something. Right. And so I went and talked to every head of X. Um, and what, what, what came out of those conversations was like, we could really move the needle for almost any one of those teams, honestly, even legal, there were things around legal. So like legal wanted to, uh, make sure that things were getting patented. Well, how do we communicate that to the employee base? How do we get people excited about that? And there's a lot of design that you can do around that. Um, e uh, HR, where people are onboarding. You know, I don't know if you've ever heard the, the yeah, yeah. So like, you know, when onboarding, you get a bunch of paperwork and whatever, but like Airbnb, for example, it's like it, the onboarding there was designed down to like the minute, right? And you talk to anyone that joined Airbnb, um, in the early days. And, and it's amazing. Like my friends would join and by Friday, they were like ready to tattoo Airbnb on their chest. Like they, whatever they did in that first week, I was like, how was your first week? They're like, I will never leave this company ever. This is the best thing. I'm like, okay. That's how good onboarding was. <laughs> it was right. Like it's, it's yeah, no, it, they, na they nailed that experience. So I think, um, to me, when I talk, when I think about, it's like, don't think of design as set. It's like, what are your company goals? And then apply design to those to those goals. And it can absolutely be applied to like 90, 95% of company goals. And to me, that's where that's where it gets really strategic and, and, and used really well. Yeah. No, very well said. I love the, the examples you shared. Um, I'd love to switch gears for a second and talk about areas where you have an edge. And what I mean by that is, you know, you can think of it as an edge, you can think of it as a superpower. And this can be either you as an individual, you as an investor uh, at Designer Fund. But where do you think you have an edge or superpower? And how does that show up day to day, either in your investing work or your work with companies? Yeah, there, there's two key areas. Okay. So the first one is, we know what good products look like. And so, and, and you think that, well, doesn't ever like, no, a lot of people just don't, they don't, they don't know what makes, what is, and, and with the difference between good and very good and very good and e exceptional, that matters because when you have a product that is exceptional, that's a product that won't need a lot of marketing spend. That's a product that won't need a, a lot of uh, customer support spend. That's a product that, you know, so it, it basically makes everything in that company way, way easier when the product is that good, right? And so uh, we, we know how to tell when a product is that or not. So that's a huge edge. Uh, second piece is we know how to build those products. So <laughs> founders who want to work with people like that um, come to us because they're like, I want to work with other people who know how to build these kinds of products. And there are very few investors, Dan, you're, you're one of a handful still. There's a lot more designer angels out there, right? But I think like people who are just full-time investing um, and have a design background or that that's, you know, we can get into that later, you know, another time, but that's, that's definitely something I've, I thought would be much more of a, they, we'd see a groundswell. If designer fund was successful, we'd see hundreds and thousands of designers becoming VCs. Has not happened. Has, has not <laughs> happened. And I, I know exactly why, and we can talk about that, but um, that is why. Um, yeah. So that's, that's a second edge is that, People want to work with others who can help them build those products. And the third thing is we design venture now. So Enrique and I basically look at all the things that frustrates founders about venture. And we're like, why, why does it work this way? And mm -hmm. most investors are like, this is the way it works. Yeah. You know? Okay. So like, let's take an example. You as a founder, you go, you have an intro meeting with a, a VC, right? And then after that meeting, you say, okay, what happens from here on out? And they're like, you know, we'll let you know. If you get an email back. <laughs> yeah, if you get an email back, right? And then like, if I get an email back, like what happens then? Oh, you might have a partner meeting. Okay, then what happens then? You know, we'll let you, you know, it's like, it's basically like super obtuse. And by the way, a lot of firms, even within the firms, different partners follow different processes. Some will just tell you right there, you get an investment. Some will take weeks of diligence. It just matters who you, who you talk to. Well, what we did is we said, okay, well, let's standardize that process. And then tell, like, when you first meet with Designer Fund, we send you, like, here is our process. It's like intro meeting, phase one, phase two, close. And here's what we need to see to move to the various phases. So you know exactly what we're looking for. 
there's no there's no hidden you know there's, there's there's no magic it's like you know what we're looking for and we can tell you if you have it or not and guess what founders love that they love that it's like it's a known transparent process so surprising so surprising and it's so simple right <laughs> all we did was, was but it's like we only did that because we talked to founders and realized like that was a, a frustration point and we're like well why is it designed this way it kind of was never des- it was designed this way to benefit the investor and so if you think about, well, what would we, how would we design it to, to benefit founders? You would do something very different, right? Yeah. Um, almost like, uh, you know, it, it's, a, it's exactly like you, you, do, you have an order. It used to be like you'd order something and it would show up at some point. Now we, it's like, hey, order process. It just shipped. Uh, it's, come, it's delivering today. It just arrived at your door. Here's a photo of it, right? That's the same thing. Like, why don't we do that for founders? And it's because like, you know, designers just have our, our absent from the venture ecosystem, and it, it, we, that we we never have had to to do that, right? Investors have never had to do that. So I think that's a huge edge for us because we approach every part of the VC ecosystem that way. Like, what are the things that are not working for us and founders and other players in the ecosystem, and let's just redesign it from the ground up to be better. Yeah. I love that example. One of my favorite things to ask guests about is books. And, you know, I'm curious for you, uh, what books are near and dear to your heart? And, you know, I think it would be interesting. I don't know if you have any answers here. So I might be kind of, you know, uh, shooting in the dark. But if you have any books that are around helping founders understand the power of design or what design is or kind of books that demystify design or that are around design. And then secondarily, if there are any books that you find yourself referring to giving out to founders that you end up investing in or working with. Yeah, you know, one thing that frustrates me, like people in tech, they love to read like business books and tech books, you know, and, and the rea- the rea- at least for me, I would say like, okay, those are fine. Those are helpful. But it's like, um, historically, when you look at like the books that have pointed us towards the future, it's been more like fiction, right? And, and, and those are the, those are, you know, book fiction and science fiction. So I actually like when I'm reading at night, I'm usually reading something like that, something that is is challenging and uh, an assertion, or or just kind of like playing with some tension that we have in the current system, the current system through storytelling, right? Because like we came up as storytellers, right? So like uh, one example, there's a there's a series called the Murderbot Diaries. Do you know about this this book series? No, never heard of it. Never heard of it. Okay, it's amazing. People who are into science fiction <laughs> love it and have heard of it. They're like, of course, I've heard of it. Um, so the Murderbot Diaries is basically this: it's a story of a thing called the Murderbot. It was a, it was a robot that was designed to do exactly what, what, what it sounds like, to murder things, right? But secretly, Murderbot has basically uh, disabled its control mechanism. So humans still think this thing is supposed to be a Murderbot, and it's pretending to still be the Murderbot. But inside, it's basic, and, and, and the, the tone of the Murderbot is like super flippant and really sarcastic. And the sounds whole amazing. Sounds it's amazing. so good, uh, um, and it's an it's amazing storytelling. But it also like what what takes it from like what we talk about good to extraordinary is that it really starts um, starting starts asking you these questions around what happens when these things these robots become sentient or like not sent, like and it's not clear that you know like it 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 does it's not controlled anymore. But is it really sentient? And like what does that mean? And at what level? And you know, and and, and it, the way it interacts with other robots who are controlled, right? And all that stuff is just like you can read someone someone's theory about AI and and robotics, and it's dull, right? It's just boring. Like, who wants to read that? But like reading the Murderbot story, it's 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 analyzing those same themes through story, and I, I find that just a lot more compelling. So yeah, I'm I'm super into that. And then the other stuff I'm into is are like coming of age stories. I'm like a huge sucker for coming of age stories, and actually. One of my favorite ones is one called The Power of One. Have you ever heard of that book? It was actually written no. by uh, someone who used to run an ad agency. And he ran an ad, ad agency for decades. And then finally, he had all these stories he wanted to get out. And he wrote, and they're like epic, epic uh, coming of age stories. So this one's called The Power of One. And you'd love, I mean, I think you'd love it. I think people who just are into coming of age stories um, would love it. And it just, it's like this, the, again, it's like, what does it mean to have perseverance and grit? and just fight and fight and fight through all these like ad- these adverse situations. Uh, it's just a remarkable story. So th- those are the things I, I tend to be more into. And if you want like a design thing, I, I think one of the best things for people to read is the design of everyday things, 
which will just all of a sudden start opening your eye to like, why is a handle like that? Why is a window shape like that? Why does my lamp do that? Or like, why is a light switch vertical like this? But like, how do I know what light switch controls which light and why isn't there a better way? Like, we're always like, right, flipping things on and off because we're like, what does this control again? Like, and there are hundreds of millions of these light switches all over the world that is not clear why does it connect to the like why was that designed that way right so it just starts all of, all of a sudden it opens your eyes to every little thing around you because everything around you was designed and it makes you ask like why yeah yeah it's a phenomenal book i i love it's a little bit of a tangent but i love the idea of you uh you know investing in in a, in a founder or in a company and then giving them the book the Murderbot diaries <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah this is, yeah. This is the book i would give you <laughs> yeah we, have, we there yeah there are other books that are more aligned with with uh yeah, with like our value system that we, that we give, but uh, but yeah, that would be funny. Like, here you go. This is uh, it's not a, it's not, it's not pro murder bots. Yes, so, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, we have to. We'll give it with a, a note. I would guess not by the by the narrator, by the yeah, way that yeah. you know the character's personality. Um, but I, I I love those recommendations. We'll link to those in the show notes, and I, I'm definitely going to download and read the murder bot diaries. Um, one of the questions that I wanted to ask, and this is I love that you brought up the design of everyday things because it's it's right exactly on that theme. But, you know, like being a designer, one of the experiences I've had is it's both amazing because I think your mind is always, you know, you're always kind of processing in the background or in the foreground of what how you might change things, how things could be improved. But it also means, at least for, for me, that I'm just frustrated constantly by so many things in the real world that are, yeah. you know, poorly designed, poorly made. And, you know, the, so I guess the question I would ask you is, how does being a designer, working in design for 20 plus years at this point, change the way you see the world and show up in just your day-to-day experience? I mean, it's exactly that. I can't, I cannot uh, order something online and just like open the box and just be like, okay, here it is. Here's the thing. Like, great, let's go. Let's start using the thing. I am constantly looking at like, you know, what, what's the, why, why did they package it this way? What's the type of, what's the label? You're why just is griping it like, why constantly. Is it, what's up? <laughs> You're just griping constantly. <laughs> it's not, it's either griping or like remarking uh, on things, you know, it's like, okay, here's, here's like something that I just ordered is this like lightning jack. It's like, why does this even exist? And why, did, okay, so now I need to open it. Like, where is the, oh, there's no like easy way to, oh, why did Apple do it this way, right? Like, you know, so there's all these like, I don't know. And even just like the fact that this exists is crazy, right? It's like, how mm-hmm. many fucking dongles do we have? You know, too many, um, too many. Too many. <laughs> like I, I have an open one and I needed another one because guess what? You know how often you lose something this tiny? <laughs> like well, yeah, like a hundred of these. Super often. Yeah. yeah. So I, I think as a designer, I think we're plagued with this endless fascination um, of like why things are the way they are, why they were designed the way they are. Um, but I think it's also it's also what what it's like that even things that are not human made I think it also I'm also intrigued by like why why nature why nature's you know different ecosystems like if you look at like right now I'm, I'm super fa- that's another thing I'm so, super fascinated by is like natural ecosystems watersheds uh, ecological systems that sort of thing and it's it's pretty interesting like I'll, I'll give I'll throw one, one one idea out there it's like that I'm still like in the, in the process of kind of thinking through, which is in the human world, uh, there's this idea of growth, right? And we always want like more humans so that, you know, if a country's not growing humans, like yeah, you're kind of screwed, right? But in, in, a, in a natural park, if all of a sudden the wolves are growing too much, like you're in trouble, right? If, if one part of that ecosystem is growing too much, like that's trouble, right? And so, so that's interesting, right? So what, what is that? What, what is that? What is it that in, in nature, we've always talked about the, the idea of sustainability and stasis and, and, um, harmony, right? Um, and, and in, in humanity, well, for humanity to thrive, we need more, we need more people, we need, right? Like wh- what's going on there? Like, and so those are the kinds of things that I think to me, I start looking at like parallels between different system design, parallel, like, and and where there's where's the dissonance like where, where where do we talk about things differently and why and so i think those are the things that i think as a designer it's like you can't turn that off right yeah. and and it's it can be definitely aggravating and frustrating but i think it's just like it's that endless intellectual curiosity um around how things are made that 
that I think I just have on constantly. I love that you brought up, you know, the design of natural ecosystems. I could launch into a series of questions <laughs> to ask you about that. We could you know, go off on a tangent for 30 minutes. So it's really hard to keep myself on, on track here. Um, one of the questions I want to ask, I've had two more questions. Uh, one is, um, you're really close to your 10-year anniversary of Designer Fund, or, or maybe you're, you're, you're almost at your, your 10-year anniversary. That's a long time. Uh, you know, one of the books that I read recently that I really enjoyed, uh, it, it's, it's long, but it's really well written, is The Power Law, which I think for many ways, if you're interested in venture, it's just a great kind of historical retrospective. And I think one of the things you learn reading that book is very few firms survive for a decade or more. And if they do, it's very hard for them to stay at the top of their game and, and be able to, to evolve as a firm. So the question I wanted to ask you is, wh- as you come up on this milestone and kind of think back on the last 10 years, what do you feel like are the biggest lessons that, you're, that you've learned and how has your thinking evolved? And this could be around venture, around the role of design and venture over the last 10 years. So, so the, it, it's maybe obvious, but, um, but I think this is not just for venture, but I think also just for people. And it's this idea of playing to your strengths. So I think for most of my life, like teachers and, um, and at work, it's always been like, hey, Ben's not good at X or, you know, he could be stronger at X. So, you know, let's work on that. You know, hey, hey history, like I, I, I never, never, never gravitate towards it. It's like, okay, so let's work on that, right? Or, uh, you know, so, but I think the thing to, um, there's a power to playing to your strengths that to me now coming into, you know, year eight, nine, 10, uh, depending on where, like, Design Fund actually started in 2012. <laughs> the first fund was 2014. So depending on yeah. where you, you know, we were actually incorporated in November of tw- of 2012. So, but we started actively before that. So I don't know, like, we're right around the 10-year mark. And for me, the the idea of playing to our strengths has been, because you come into this and you start interviewing people like John Doerr and these luminaries and you say, oh, like, how do I become that person? Right. And those are, those are the heroes or Warren Buffett. Everyone wants to be the next Warren Buffett. Right. It's the emulation game. Yeah. And it's like, don't, you don't need to be the next Warren Buffett won't be Warren Buffett. Like it'll be someone totally different and they'll be going about it in a totally different way. And so I think I've, I've gotten a lot more comfortable in, um, in kind of doing it our way. Right. So, okay. So here's a good example. So like, most funds, if you're successful, the expectation is just get bigger and bigger and bigger, right? Um, well, guess what? Like your fund size, though, is your strategy. And so Designer Fund for six years, or sorry, eight years now, we've been building all these relationships with great lead funds and they're generous funds and they do all, all the things that, you know, it's like they know about how to build great sales teams. They know about um, how to do go to market well. And, it's, you know, as, as we've been in this, like we've learned those things too, but I'm certainly not like the expert. I know, I know where my, you know, where I'm deep and I know where I know enough to, to be dangerous, but where I, where I recommend experts. And so there's this expectation, like if you're a small fund, get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And then all of a sudden you're just something very different. And guess what? And instead, you know, so we're really collaborative and Rika and I just, in our essence, we love to collaborate. And I think most designers do. Well, what happens if you're a lead fund that is also, super into collaborating well that kind of doesn't work that's really mm-hmm. tough because if you're a lead fund there's only one lead oh only it's one a zero-sum game coming. you've zero changed game. games totally. yeah, yeah yeah and so but for example if you're not a lead like and this ha- this happened to us recently like there's someone that, that raised money and they said to me like hey we're, we're saving you know a 500k check for you guys but we have six leads help me pick a lead right wow. um well that's really powerful right that we can do that but guess what if our fund was too big we could like if I was the seventh term sheet going up against, you know, Sequoia and Greylock and those, can I out Sequoia, Sequoia, I agree. You know, it's like, everyone's like, who can build the next Sequoia? Like you don't necessarily need to be building the next Sequoia to beat Sequoia or to do as good as, and even just beat Sequoia, like even saying that, what are you doing? Like, it's just like, do you want to be a good investor? Why? What plays to your strengths and, and play that game, play, play the game the way you want to play it. And so for Enrique and I, we realized like, Let's make sure that our funds are are of the size that allow us to be collaborative. And just because LPs want to put more money to work and are seeing great returns from us um, and want us to b- build bigger funds, that that's not the reason to put together a bigger fund. 
the the bigger reason is because you want to be a lead fund. But if you don't, if that doesn't play your strength, don't do that. So I think that's the thing. Um, to me, one of the things I've learned is just just kind of own, be you know the the power of being a designer investor and what you're good at, um, and 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 do that, and don't try to be. You know, don't don't be like, oh, I'll put on the vest and I'll you know talk that game. And like, you know, I'll I'll out outdo them in, at their game. Like, do your own, you know, outdo them at your game and make them play your game. So I think that's that's the thing that I've I've kind of really come to tr- you know come to realize. But it's taken a long time, man, because it's like you basically feel like a fish out of you know you, you feel like uh, there's the imposter syndrome and VCs are you know for all the shit that we say about VCs, most of them are really fucking smart. Most of them are really fucking driven. Um, you know, most of them are really good at sales. You don't get to be in this business unless, right? And most of them have a ton of confidence for better or worse, right? <laughs> so like you're, that's, the, that's the, the system of people that you're, you're going into. Uh, and it's really easy to feel like, oh, crap, like I, I didn't uh, go to that school or I didn't, you know, spend eight years at that top fund or whatever it is. Um, but like, but yeah, but own kind of the things that you're strong at that every investor would be like, well, okay, well, I can't do what they do, right? Like most investors yeah. can't build products the way we build products, right? No, so, not at all. Yeah, exactly. So I, I think um, that's the thing over the years that I've come to kind of find more peace with. It's like, hey, you you belong here. And in fact, and by the way, our returns are like top quartile return. Like not only do we belong, we're like better than most <laughs> investors, right? <laughs> So like, you know, people have always talked like, should designers code? And maybe the next thing, should designers invest? And so far, the answer, I think, is yes. I love it. The answer is so well said. Um, you know, I can already tell just in the questions I've asked you so far that I'm going to be listening to this interview many other times. <laughs> I, love, I love it. Um, last question. If you could go back to the start of your career and whisper any words of advice in your ear, uh, is there anything you would tell your former kind of younger self? Totally. I was thinking about this question. Um, the the further I, I I am, um. So did you did you go to like design school or no? No, self taught. <laughs> self taught. Okay. So uh, and you're not alone. There's there's t- plenty of like self taught designers. Um. But there's also a lot of like designers that go to design mm-hmm. school. And I think, um, every designer when they when they talk to you about uh being a designer and it the, there's this idea of portfolio right, and portfolio is the output, it's the visual output of all the stuff that we do. And we obsess over that, right? And early in my career, I think it was all about, you know, how is this going to look in my portfolio? Is this is this piece of work good enough to be in my portfolio? Even when I was at Facebook, I was like, I want to make sure that this is like everything. Everything I do, I'm like, is this good enough for me to put on my website and say this? Is, you know, I want to show uh, in my life's work. Will this? Will this? You know, meet that bar. Uh, for life's work, and the reality is, when I when I look back at my experiences, I cannot, for the life of me, tell you like if uh, about the output of the work that we did. But I can absolutely tell you about the relationships I built at those companies, and the like memories of the things that we did together. And the some a lot a lot of it was around the work. Um, but a lot of it wasn't. And so I think, I think for me, it's like, don't obsess over the output as much as who are you, who are you around? And, and what's, what's the impact of the work that you're having? Um, because I think too much, too, too much designers are, are kind of being told, uh, to just focus on, on kind of, you know, and even I said like the craft, right. But it's like, when you look at the people who are, who are doing great work, a lot of it is like, uh, it's collaborative. It has impact. Um, and what they remember is, is kind of the environment for me, at least like it's, it's, the, it's the environment and, and the experience mm-hmm. that we had together. And so I think as, as designers, we're just too, yeah, I would tell myself, Hey, like, don't forget to just kind of step back and kind of revel in the people that are, that are around you, the experiences you're having. And actually like, make time for those experiences, you know, make time to, to go spend time with the people you're working with, make time to stay up really late with the people you're working with, make time to do those silly shenanigans things 
Um, and actually, you know, and, and lately I've been thinking a lot about like this remote work thing that we're all going into and basically like how much that's taken away from people, right? The, the, it's like, everyone's like, it's so much more efficient. Well, guess what? Like work is not just about like doing things efficiently. And again, that's the designer in me, right? The designer in me is like, what is the em- employee experience? And so the business people are like, this is great. We're getting like, you know, 70% more efficiency. That was at first. But now we're actually finding that the efficiency gains are not there. Guess why? Because it's not as fun. It's not as, in- it's not as interactive. It's not as engaging, right? Also now efficiency is falling off a cliff. Well, as a designer, I could have told you from day one that this would happen. And so I think that to me, it's like, I would have gone back to myself and just say like, hey, take, take them, you know, celebrate those moments and kind of make time for more of those moments. And because that's the stuff you'll really remember. I think it's so well said, you know, and it makes me think of, it's like your work is almost backwards looking. That's what you get to keep after you leave the place or it's what you take away. It's some, you know, I don't know, it's some proof that you were there and you did some things, but the relationships uh, are what will make you a better person, a better designer, a better thinker, a better leader, six months, 12 months, 24 months, 36 months from now, it's all of those things. And they take time, it takes time for those things to kind of for you to process them and for that to, you know, kind of surface in, in who you are and the way you show up in the world. But I think it's incredibly well, incredibly well said. Um, yeah, no, maybe another like enough. a clarification. I remember like my first job, you know, we were, it was at an agency and all of us were basically pitted one against the other. So the agency was common. So this is the agencies. Yeah. So they basically a client would say, Hey, I need a new website. And like three of us would design and the best site wins, right? And so the you know, three designers would go off on their own. And if you win, if your thing was like this this the thing that the client wanted, it's like you won. Well, like what is that? Like what experience is that, right? That's like and it's almost like building relationships there was the, was you almost felt like, well, I don't why would I want these are my competitors in the company they're your competitors because we're all competing you know for the client to choose our thing and so like that that was like one of my first experiences right and to go from that to like what facebook and designer fund is was ultra collaborative it's like if you do well we all do well and that's what we're trying to like even go lean into and same as a fund as a firm like it's it's easy to be like okay well if we do, in most funds like it's mostly the partners that if they do well like the partners do well for Enrique and I, it's like, how do we make it so if Designer Fund well, if Designer Fund does well, the entire design ecosystem does well, hundreds of designer angels do well, thousands of design leaders do well. That for us is like the, the success beyond just the returning 3, 5x to, to our LPs. And we actually believe like if we, it's not only are those things at odds with each other, we actually think if we do those things well, if we serve the design ecosystem well at scale, if we serve um, uh, the VC ecosystem with design at scale. Well, the returns actually will will follow, and it, it, even it be better if we do that well. Well, I think it's a perfect note to end on. Thank you so much for joining me, Ben. This has been an amazing conversation. I really appreciate you taking the time. Yeah, man. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for listening. You can find the show notes and transcript for this episode at outlieracademy.com slash 132. That's outlieracademy.com slash 132. For more from Ben Blumenrose, listen to episode 131, where Ben joins me on Outlier Academy as part of our Outlier Investor Series to break down what he and his partner Enrique Allen have been building for the last decade at Designer Fund, which is an early stage venture capital firm that backs founders that both recognize the power of design and are committed to getting design right in their company from day one. Designer Fund was founded by Ben Blumenrose and Enrique Allen in 2012 after the two met at a program put on by Stanford's D School, where students use design to develop their own creative potential. When Ben and Enrique founded Designer Fund, there were few companies in Silicon Valley outside of Apple that understood the power of design to build incredible products, create a category defining brand, and ultimately forge an enduring company. There were also no other venture capitalists with a pure design background. And yet, over the last decade, Designer Fund has built an exceptional venture firm. They've produced top quartile returns, beating out most of their competitors' peers in the market at large, and were early investors in a wave of design-centric companies that have defined the last decade, including Stripe and Gusto. To listen to that episode, simply visit outlieracademy.com slash 131. That's outlieracademy.com slash 131. You can find videos of all of our interviews on YouTube at youtube.com slash outlier. 
Outlier Academy. On our channel, you'll find all of our full-length interviews, as well as our favorite short clips from every single episode, including this one. So make sure to subscribe. We post new videos and clips every single week. And if you haven't already, follow us on Twitter for more from Outlier Academy. Thank you so much for listening. We'll see you right here with a brand new episode next Friday.